Chapter 4, Testing Warmer Waters The Entente Cordiale was hailed as proof positive of a new era of Anglo-French mutual understanding and friendship that would finally bury age-old antagonisms between the two. It did, but that was never its prime purpose. Pursuits of global dominance was at the core of every action taken by the secret elite and the creation of alliances with France followed some years later by Russia were first and foremost arrangements of strategic necessity. Their large armies were required for the eventual destruction of Germany. Additionally, the secret terms hidden in the unpublished parts of the alliance were mutually approved to increase the power and influence of Germany's enemies and pushed the Berlin government towards a possible war. The Entente heralded the end of disputes between Britain and France over North Africa and both declared that they had no intention of altering the political status of Egypt or Morocco, a sure sign that they meant exactly the opposite. The Times, the first organ of secret elite propaganda, hailed the signing of the surest pledge of universal peace and praised the part played by King Edward in bringing Anglo-French cordiality to a new level. Old claims and counterclaims were, were to be put aside, and French President Lobet and Foreign Minister Delcasse were presented as distinguished statesmen who deserve the gratitude of their fellow, fellow countrymen. The Ancant Cordial was not as it seemed, Top secret codicils hidden within its published articles, signed on that very same day of April 8, 1904, concealed the double dealing upon which the Entente had been settled. The secret clauses effectively guaranteed British control of Egypt in return for French control over Morocco. Britain had earlier promised to leave Egypt as soon as its financial affairs were in order but such an open-ended promise meant nothing. The great financial houses in London, Rothschilds and Barings, had secured vast concessions by reconstructing Egyptian finances. They held large commercial interest there, and unfettered control of Egypt was a cash cow for these British bankers. Thanks to the Rothschilds, not only did the British government own, a, own most of the shares in the Suez Canal, but it all but it also acted as the strategic and commercial gatekeeper of the Gulf, the Middle East and India through the canal. This, but it also acted as a strategic and commercial gatekeeper to the Gulf, the Middle East, and India through the canal. Britain essentially controlled the entrance of the Mediterranean at Gibraltar and its exit at Suez. Do not imagine that strengthening the capacity to shut down the Mediterranean was a chance happening. Hidden from Parliament and people alike, Britain agreed that France would take control of Morocco once they had effectively overthrown the Sultan. In plain English, it was a carve-up. This paved the way for the annexation of Morocco by France with assured diplomatic support from Britain. Other nations, countries on whom King Edward had recently showered honors, were sucked into the Mediterranean vortex by casual gifts of territories they did not own. Italy's goodwill was secured by the promise of Tripoli. Spurred on by Britain, Italy agreed to the eventual French possession of Morocco in exchange for their acceptance of Italy's claim to the tripoli Cyrencia area of northern Libya. In addition, Italy secretly promised to remain neutral if France was attacked by either Germany or Austria-Hungary. The French reciprocated with a similar commitment should Italy be attacked. It was a pact of strict and mutual neutrality that in effect made a nonsense of Italy's commitment to any aggression stance that the Triple Alliance might take. Relations between Britain and Italy had historically been amicable, and even within the context of the Triple Alliance, Italy had insisted that a clause be included recognizing the fact that 
On no account would she go to war against Britain. With Kitchener and his army encamped literally next door to Egypt, Italy could never have moved to Tripoli without Britain's approval. Inside the foreign office, secretly agents considered Italian royalty and government ministers who had been courted assiduously by King Edward as sympathetic allies. Edward's determination to prize them away from the Triple Alliance had begun in earnest. King Alfonso Spain was also held to be more than sympathetic to Britain and France. Edward VII's investment in the Spanish monarchy continued to bear fruit. And in colluding with France and Britain, Spain was assured a considerable part of Morocco's Mediterranean coast. Having surrendered any British interest in Morocco by deed of the Entente, by the, by the Entente, the secret elite chose Spain as the perfect surrogate replacement. The most experienced diplomat, Sir Arthur Nicholson, was moved from Tangier to Madrid in 1904, and his presence guaranteed their involvement in all that followed. Hidden behind the public announcements, the secret article became the opening gambit in the secret elite's move to systematically provoke Germany. While they were prepared to concede minor points over Newfoundland, Siam, and West Africa, secret articles accompanying the treaty centered on Britain's control then assumed rights in Egypt and France's own imperial plans for Morocco. It was designed to insult and antagonize Germany whose rights and responsibilities in Morocco were every bit as strong as those of Britain and France. The major powers had jointly signed a mutual advantageous agreement in 1880 at Madrid, stating that Moroccan independence should be protected. Britain, France, and Germany, acting in unison, had promised that free trade with the country would be honored. It was not some altruistic decision. They were simply a group of foreign exploiters happy to share the spoils of a weaker nation. But Germany was bound to react when the secret agreements of the Entente came into play. She had a treaty with Morocco, kept a diplomatic representative in Tangier, had considerable growing commercial interests in the country, and had cooperated fully with Britain in resisting any French, previous French attempts to claim a privileged position there. Furthermore, she had no intention of allowing France and Britain to exclude her from the Mediterranean by a diplomatic agreement to which she had not been made party. How did the perpetrators expect Germany to react? The secret elite network controlled the world's finest diplomatic and commercial spy rings and were well aware of the effects that their decisions would have. The diplomatic service was the best informed and most proactive arm of British foreign policy, and they knew that Germany would learn the details of the secret arrangement. Germany was being deliberately put to the test. News of the Entente was first greeted by the German government with temperate approval. On the 12th of April, the German Chancellor Bernhard von Below was questioned about it in Reichstag and had, at this point in time, he had no knowledge of the secret clauses and talked in terms of its benefit to world peace. Our interests there are commercial, and we are especially interested that common order should prevail in Morocco. We must protect our commercial interests there, but have no reason to fear that they will be set aside or infringed by any power. Both the press and politicians in Germany accepted that a peaceful understanding between Britain and France was of benefit to everyone in Europe. Relations between Britain and Germany appeared to be harmonious. On the face of it, they had no reason to be concerned. The French government took advantage of Britain's approval by acting as if it had some special governance over Morocco. Behind the mask of apparent good intent, a Franco-Spanish declaration of October 1904 stated publicly that they remained firmly attached to the integrity of the Moorish Empire under the sovereignty of the Sultan. It was a lie, an act of studied hypocrisy, because in yet another secret co codicil, they callously agreed to partition Morocco between them. 
The French and Spain intended to share the spoils of the country with Britain's full approval. And on the 6th of October, the French ambassador in London, Paul Cambon, advised the British Foreign Secretary, Doug Classy requests you to be good enough to keep the convention entirely secret. Lansdowne made it perfectly clear that the confidential nature of the conspiracy would be duly respected. Del Cassi was a man close to heart of the secret elite, and his agreement with Spain to carve up Morocco was conducted with their consent. Secret elite fingerprints touched every corner of this deal, but the question to be asked was, from whom were these actions being kept secret? The answer is the British and French public, whose natural aversion to secret treaties was well understood. For many, Germany would learn of them. For sure, Germany would learn of them. There were too many indiscreet diplomats in Madrid and St. Petersburg for Germany not to learn the truth within a relatively short period. Diplomatic secrets rarely lasted long, and the secret elite knew, indeed hoped, that it would provoke an ang a very angry German reaction, which would then be rejected as German propaganda against the Entente. Fortified by the, by the Entente and British collusion, the French could not stop themselves taking from taking advantage of the fact that they already occupied Algeria and sought to expand their, expand their colonial stranglehold in northern Africa. On the 11th of January 1905, the French ambassador at Tangier was ordered to submit a program of unacceptable reforms to the Sultan. The Moroccan leader refused to bow to their demands and had no option other than to turn to Germany for support and advice. Understandably, German had, Germany had no intention of allowing Morocco's independence to be undermined by anyone at the behest of German at the behest of the German Chancellor, Kaiser Wilhelm, who had been enjoying a scheduled Mediterranean cruise for reasons of his health, reluctantly visited Tangier on the 31st of March, 1905, to declare his support for the Sultan. According to the New York Times, Tangier was, a guard, was gardened with flowers, and so much was spent on flags and bunting that no one could doubt that it meant more than merely a courtesy welcome. Though he spent only two hours there, the political significance of his message reverberated far longer. Kaiser Wilhelm made two fairly straightforward statements. The first asserted German's commercial rights in Morocco, and the second insisted that the sovereignty of the Sultan and the integrity of Morocco must remain intact. Morocco's independence had never been questioned any more than the independence of Persia or Russia or of the United States for that matter. An agreement, secret or otherwise, between Britain and France carried no authority to change that. When the Kaiser visited Tangier, he already knew that about the secret articles attached to the Entente and of the secret Franco-Spanish convention. He knew that the deals had purposely been concealed, and he was also aware that a series of reforms had been prepared for the Sultan's acceptance that were absolutely incompatible with Morocco's independence. The German government declared that no one country should attempt to take control of Morocco and with dignified diplomatic propriety, the Kaiser called for an international conference to resolve the matter. Von Bulow warned the international community that France might assume a protectorate over Morocco and expel other commercial competitors just as it had previously done in Tunis. The Sultan agreed with the Kaiser's reasoned approach and invited interested parties to a conference in Tangier. All hell was let loose in the British and French newspapers. Germany and the Kaiser were ridiculed and vilified. The secret elite unleashed their outraged press to denounce the Kaiser with unrestrained violence. He was accused of deliberately attempting to destroy the Entente as a prelude to making war on France. While the claims of evil German intent poured out in a torrent of sheer vitriol, and any voice of reason was assailed as that of a traitor or a coward. By creating the Moroccan crisis, the secret elite successfully generated a fear and manufactured a menace where none had existed. A British general election was in the offing, and a change of government seemed certain. Europe at peace with itself was the very last circumstance under which the secret elite wanted the incoming liberal government to take office. That could have been a disaster. 
The public wanted the radical liberals to cut spending on the Navy and Army immediately and redistribute the money to further social reform. Secret elite ambition might have been thwarted by an incoming liberal government. The serious steps that will be explained in detail later were already in place to protect their plans. The timing of the Moroccan crisis was perfect. Just as the election of January 06 got underway, the international crisis generated alarm and created a climate of fear. Nothing more assuredly protects spending on armaments than a climate of fear. And what had actually happened? What had actually happened? Britain, France, and Spain had acted without any international sanction. There was no proceeding in international law to justify their unwarranted intervention in Morocco. In France, Foreign Minister Del Casse was determined to stand his ground. He refused point blank to accept the conference and depicted the Kaiser's reasonable request as a challenge to the Entente itself. His allies in the British and German his allies in the British and French press took up Del Casse's claim and grossly misrepresented the German position. There was talk of war, serious talk. Foreign Secretary Lansdowne secretly approved initial conversations between British and French military staff about preparations for war with Germany. The Belgian military staff was also included in direct talks with their British counterparts at this juncture. Strong hold to this thought. Hold on to this thought. Belgium was involved in secret military plans for a possible war of aggression against an unsuspecting Germany, but almost a decade later would be presented as the innocent victims of German aggression. King Edward was reported to have told French ministers that in case of need, Britain would intervene on the side of France. Should you find it fanciful that Britain could have gone to war, consider the view of the President of the United States. After a private meeting with the British ambassador of May 1905, Roosevelt was left with the impression that the British government was anxious to see Germany humiliated and quite willing to face the possibility of war. One month later, in a letter to the German ambassador in Washington, Roosevelt, wo Roosevelt wrote, I felt that if a war were to break out, whatever might happen to France, England would profit immensely while Germany would lose her colonies and perhaps her fleet. Such being the case, I did not feel that anything I might say would carry any weight with England. Undoubtedly, Del Casse believed that he would have British support if it came to war with Germany, but the French foreign minister pressed too hard. Prime Minister Rovier greatly appreciated the private counsel he had with King Edward, but shrank from the prospect of a war predicated on his refusal to take part in a conference. When it became apparent that all that Kaiser wanted was an international conference, and that the majority of the French parliament was in favor of such an accommodation, the clamor and outrage from the secret elite's press redoubled and moved swiftly to support Del Casse. As the liberal MP, E.D. Morel, observed, the powerful occult influences which move behind the scenes and mold public opinion did their utmost to counteract the more moderate sections of French public life. In this instance, the occult influences failed. In the secret Anglo-Franco-Spanish diplomatic arrangements were essentially a serious breach of trust towards the people and parliaments they were supposed to represent. That was the bottom line. Germany, on the other hand, sought transparency, not secret codicils. Germany was in the right. Theoph Theophile, Theophile de Classe, let his personal hatred of Germany sway both common sense and reason. He knew that powerful forces in Britain were entirely behind him, and he thought he was unstoppable. Indeed, one observer felt that he had, that he was much closer to the king than was his own French colleagues, adding that Del Casse behaved as though he was one of the king, behaved as though he was one of King Edward's ministers. Del, Del Casse would not bend to any German request for a conference to settle the Moroccan question. 
More than that, he thought it intolerable to yield to German pressure. In June of 1905, sensible heads within the French government realized the grave danger to European peace and sought a reasonable understanding with Germany. Delcasse vehemently defended his position of no surrender, but found himself overruled by the entire French cabinet and resigned. Delcasse's fall from grace was a blow to the secret elite. Controversially, King Edward publicly invited him to a breakfast meeting, which surprised and alarmed many Parisians and the Belgian ambassador in Paris. Such a mark of courtesy to M. Delcasse at the moment has aroused much comment. Frenchmen feel that they have been dragged against their will into an orbit of, French poli- of English policy, a policy whose consequence they dread and which they generally condemned by overthrowing M. Del Casse. People fear that this is a sign that England wants so to envenom the situation that war will become inevitable. Consider the implications. Del Casse has been forced out of the French cabinet, but King Edward responded with a very public display of support for the Ravenchise cause. Ravenchise cause. He could have held a private meeting with an old friend, but chose instead to draw attention to his unwavering supports of Del Casse. He abused his undoubted popularity in France to publicly endorse a known warmonger. It was yet another example of the king's involvement in politics. He repeatedly broke the constitutional convention that a monarch should not interfere in politics, not just in Britain, but in staunchly republican France. There could only have been one reason. The secret elite knew that the recovery of the lost provinces was the emotional pull that would eventually stir Frenchmen to war with Germany, and King Edward was the means through whom they continued to express their support for Del Casse and the Ravenchist. The Germans considered Del Casse's resignation as a diplomatic triumph, recognition that the French architect of the devious secret articles had been abandoned by the voices of reason, oblivious to the psychological effect that Del Casse's diplomatic humiliation was bound to have in longer terms. The Kaiser genuinely believed that, with him gone, the thorny question of Alsace-Lorraine Alsace-Lorraine was now closed. In fact, Del Casse's demise was an immediate point of contention in the British, per- in the British press which began to treat the Moroccan crisis as an Anglo-German affair rather than a Franco-German dispute. The secret elite represented matters. The secret elite presented matters as serious proof of Germany's aggression. As Germany, uh, the secret elite presented matters as serious proof of Germany's aggressive powers and France's defensive weakness. King Edward signaled his strong support for France by studiously avoiding the Kaiser in the autumn of 1905, and relations between the two plummeted to a new low. Wilhelm was suspicious of his mischief-making uncle and expressed the view that some very influential people in England wished for war. Unaware that he was talking directly to one of the very influential people at the heart of the secret elite, the Kaiser gave an interview to Alfred Beat during which he repeated allegations that Edward and Lord Lansdowne had threatened an invasion of of Schooler's Whig, Holstein, and complained bitterly about the cruel personal insults that the British press always leveled against them. His thoughts were naturally passed from be it to Lord Escher and King Edward. After a year of deliberately manipulated international friction with blustering false allegations leveled against Germany, reasons prevailed thanks in no small way to the intervention of President Roosevelt, who agreed that America would take part in the mediation. A conference was held in the fifth on the fifteenth. A conference was held from the fifteenth of January to the seventh of April in nineteen oh six at the Algeciras and the Spanish port on the Bay of Gibraltar. At the Spanish port of the Bay on the Bay of Gibraltar, thirteen nations, including Morocco, Holland, Belgium, Austria, Austria, Hungary, Portugal, and Sweden, 
engaged in the delicate task of reconciling the French claims for predominance with the demand of equality for all. It took three months to agree a, to agree a satisfactory resolution. The conference reestablished political integrity for Morocco and agreed equal economics and commercial rights for all the powers, as Germany had long insisted was both right and proper. While the end product was an inevitable compromise, the process provided evidence of how closely the British political and diplomatic elite supported France. The Entente was not weakened, far from it. Before the conference had opened, King Edward promised the French ambassador, tell us what you want on each point and we will support you without restriction or reserves. The French, the German envoy complained that the British were more French than the French and hinted that if the conference failed, it could be blamed fairly and squarely on the British envoy, Sir Arthur Nicholson. This was a particularly astute observation since Sir Arthur was earmarked for greater secret elite work within the foreign office and enabled their politics to hold fast inside white wall. If the French were worried less, the new liberal governments that had taken office in Britain in 1905 would prove less supportive, Algeciras dispelled their doubts. Other commitments were also agreed at this precise point, to which we shall come shortly. Irrespective of the party in power at Westminster, the secret elite had an iron grip on British foreign policy. Was it feasible? As President Roosevelt suggested, that Britain really would have gone to war over Morocco in 1905, or were they simply testing the waters, determining how far they could press Germany? The lessons learned were salutary and saved gross embarrassment at a later date. First and foremost, they were not nearly ready to challenge Germany's army in Europe. Second, they had overestimated the strength of French ravenchism. There was no critical mask of popular feeling against Germany and France. Delcasse was more like the voice of the prophet crying in the wilderness than the focal point of a powerful political movement. The French government, unnerved by their own insecurity about the strength of the Entente, required reassurances that were to have long-term implications. Secret Anglo-French political and military conversations were stepped up and committees formed to ensure that the impetus of war that the impetus for war with Germany was not lost in the desert sandstorm of Morocco or the political upheavals that seemed to threaten continuity in Britain and France. These were years of change through which the secret elite guided their forces with consummate skill, for their fingerprints are to be found on each and every major incident.